Thank okay. you very much, uh, Mark, for that extremely generous introduction for announcing the uh, demonstration, which will be taking place uh, this Thursday uh, in front of the University Center, a, a physical demonstration, although a socially distanced one, as the students who've organized it uh, point out. I do hope many of you who are in New York City uh, can be there. Uh, and thank you, Silvina, um, for being here. Uh, as Mark mentioned, our department secretary, uh, Silvina Palacio, is one of those 122 workers who lost their positions. Um, later on in my presentation today, I will talk about administrative bloat as a phenomenon in the neoliberal university. Silvina, and more generally the position of department secretary that we have had in our department for decades, a single secretary to support all of us, not just faculty, but many, many students, uh, is not an example of administrative bloat. She's an example of someone who is absolutely necessary to the functioning uh, of our department to enable us to undertake the research that we do, but more importantly, to enable the students to uh, be uh, taught, advised, and to have a home uh, that is moderately well-functioning, and it's never especially well-functioning at the new school. So uh, the loss of her position came as a severe blow to all of us, and uh, I want to express my solidarity, as we have all done uh, with her, and my outrage, as we have collectively expressed um, the majority of members of our department uh, in, uh, in a letter which we have sent uh, to the trustees and the president of the university. With those preliminaries, let me also mention that indeed, as Mark noted, I have been working on this uh, set of issues since the summer, more or less uh, because I felt a need to do that, a, a responsibility to the university community uh, to question what I took to be a unjustified narrative which was being presented. Uh, of financial exigency uh, and of there being no alternative but to the drastic cuts which were being proposed. And that is something which uh, I have, of course, um, been able to uh, do only with the help of certain students. As Mark mentioned, I will uh, say exactly uh, a small student who have been with this work uh, and um, bringing a spotlight to issues which are otherwise obscured, indeed have been structurally obscured in my memory at the New School and I think in the memory of others, where faculty and students have recurrently asked questions to which they have never received answers, forcing us to look at public records in order to make sense of the reality, which is what we have tried to do, and thereby. Uh, also uh, influencing the administration to be just a little bit more transparent, embarrassing them to some extent, I would say, uh, into a greater degree of transparency, which uh, has never been uh, really uh, practiced or um, present uh, at the new school. Uh, that is by way of background. Let me also say, though, that uh, I thought uh, to make lemons from lemonade, no, it's the other way around, isn't it? Lemonade from lemons, so to speak, uh, having undertaken this um, effort uh, to um, try to, to, to uh, put it in a more general context and to understand what are the forces which are influencing higher education today, which have given rise to this phenomenon in the new school, but also more generally, which we are today experiencing and trying to address. Uh, I have been, of course, like many of us in universities, following uh, the larger discussion about higher education for a number of years, but this seemed an apt and necessary opportunity to bring all of the threads together in order to make sense of the situation for myself and also for others and to put the specific exercise that I and others have done um, uh, on the new school in its proper uh, context, uh, which is to say in the context of higher education as a whole in the United States and also uh, in the world. Uh, let me uh, with that begin my form uh, uh, technical competence that I may or may not possess. So I am trying to uh, uh, share my screen and my presentation. I hope you can all see that now. Let me know if you can. Um, the title of the presentation is The Political Economy of the New Liberal University with the New School as Example. And I will indeed um, begin with a general treatment of the 
uh, concept of the neoliberal university. And then I will move in the latter part of my presentation to the new school as an example. There are quite a few slides, so please excuse me if I rush through them. I'd rather do that and give you some of the ideas are, leave some time Okay. Uh, what is the New Liberal University? Uh, I'm going to describe the New Liberal University in terms of uh, four concepts, not necessarily exhaustive. This is very preliminary and open to revision. A discourse of market competition, financialization, cost and revenue driven decisions, and inequality all of which I think are aspects of uh, neoliberalism writ large. Uh, at this stage, this is a set of observations about how we might think about the neoliberal university or the increasingly neoliberal character of the university. It's not a definition. I don't uh, put forward a definition at this moment, in part because I am well aware that this is a, a terrain in which there have been very heated debates on the definition of neoliberalism as a concept. And I don't want to enter into that. I don't think that would be useful. Um, uh, uh, way to investigate this problem at this stage, uh, but rather to, to point to these different forces or elements which are impinging upon the university and have been for some decades now. Okay. Uh, I want to also underline that there is a continuum of experiences in universities, uh, and these run from what we might call the traditional university with neoliberal characteristics. Uh, uh, referring, uh, of course, to, uh, or par paraphrasing uh, uh, roughly uh, a, a very famous uh, statement. Uh, and an example of this, a traditional university with neoliberal characteristics would be deep pocketed Ivy League institutions, which have the freedom in many respects to operate uh, without uh, financial exigencies pressing upon them, uh, but which nevertheless um, give considerable attention to financial considerations. Another example would be public institutions which are increasingly reliant on private money or on the need to provide what we might call productivist justifications of why they exist and of how it is that they operate to legislatures, for example, as well as to uh, the community at large. Uh, that's on one end. I think for universities, universities, uh, and faith institutions and that will be very relevant for understanding the new school as we will see with for example its heavy reliance on adjunct labor, which it um, turns out for those who have studied uh, the new school, this will not be a surprise, um, is a very old characteristic of the new school. And so in some ways, the new school uh, was a pioneer of this phenomenon of the neoliberal university, even so to speak, avant la lettre. So even before we had a way of talking about it, the new school was, was practicing it. I'd also like to note that changing a university uh, might seem at times like turning around a super tanker because of all of the complexities involved, the uh, prerogatives which various constituencies understand themselves to have, uh, the existence of uh, tenure and many other uh, facets. But nevertheless, it's possible. And that's one of the things which presidents, especially in the neoliberal era, have been called upon to do. The context apart from neoliberal reform uh, in, the, in, in a uh, broader uh, societal moment of embracal of uh, of markets and private property uh, and financial considerations is what we might call massification or what has been called massification, the enormous expansion of higher education globally over the last decades. The United States, as many of you may know, was a leader in terms of the share of its population which had university degrees early on, uh, but many other countries have caught up through building additional universities, the UK being a prime example. Uh, but a number of other universities, uh, a number of other countries have done this as well. And of course, in the United States too, that proportion has been steadily uh, expanding uh, through increase in the number of institutions and their enrollments uh, over, over the course of the 20th century and uh, early part of the 21st century. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, 
get into the substantive uh, discussion by referring to uh, the content of the discourse of market competition. The following few slides will be on the neoliberal policy environment, which has the various components I mentioned. Many of you will be familiar with everything that I'm about to describe, even intimately familiar. Nothing in it will come as a surprise uh, because we have all been speaking prose without knowing it. Certainly the university administrators, they may not know the concept of neoliberalism, but they certainly know the concepts which I'm about to describe. For instance, conceiving of the university as a service provider in a competitive so-called industry with employees servicing customers. This is a dominant element in neoliberal discourse. And again, uh, I'm not saying that it's the only element in university discourse, but I'm pointing to a facet of prevailing discourse, which is its neoliberal uh, facet. Uh, a growing importance attached to marketing and to rankings, whether of the greatest party school or the greatest research output. I considered putting up a screenshot of the various rankings of the greatest party school, but I thought you could Google that yourself. Uh, obviously of interest, not just from the standpoint of students, but presumably from the standpoint of universities seeking to attract uh, students. Although of course, they may have uh, many different goals which they're trying to weigh. This competition is engaged in uh, implicitly, if not explicitly on a global as well as a national scale, requiring attention to universally legible rankings. I have myself been called upon to be an evaluator for some of the well-known rankings, the QS uh, rankings, for example, which are widely used uh, by um, university administrations and even higher education ministries and governments uh, to determine which institutions in their countries are the best and most deserving of resources and investment. Uh, to my mind, uh, the meaningfulness of these rankings is very limited for many reasons, including the extraordinarily poorly designed questions, uh, which uh, many of them feature, which I have a mind to write about on a diff at a different point. But the relevant uh, uh, aspect for us is simply that this creates a universal legibility, an ability to make sense in certain terms of what excellence means. In our department, being dis a distinctive department within the world of economics, not ranked as a top department according to conventional indicators, but uh, having a type of excellence of our own, undoubtedly, uh, because of our unconventional nature. This is certainly something we are uh, extremely well aware of. And of course, investment in world-class amenities and attractions, so-called world-class ones, uh, has been a major feature as well, with some of the middle tier institutions, for example, making massive investments in aspects of their physical plant, which they have advertised as uh, improving student experience. Uh, this competition cascades to institutions further down the hierarchy uh, to various extents. Next, financialization. A growing necessity for self-financing of institutions. Diminishing public subsidies, whether direct or indirect. According to the Pew Foundation, 34% of public college and university budgets came from federal and state governments combined in 2017, which is to say, that 66% uh, came from other sources. Now, uh, that is a reduction uh, of the amount of public money as compared to the past. Uh, I don't have the uh, uh, exact numbers, but I, uh, uh, they're, they're easily found. A local new school example, which I came across the other day uh, in reading Judith Friedlander's book on the history of the new school. Uh, the new school received a $5 million federal grant in 1967 for the construction of 65 Fifth Avenue the graduate faculty's building, uh, the acquisition and construction. That is $39 million in today's dollars. And as she describes, it was a last minute uh, decision on the part of a trustee and the president of the new school at the time to make an application for this federal grant, which they received. Those kinds of monies are nowhere present today. Viewing the stewardship of the university in terms of income streams, cost and profit centers, assets and liabilities with financial goals to be maximized is at the center of the financialized worldview. The university administration conceives of itself as entrepreneurial and perhaps is in some way forced to be, making gambles perhaps fueled by debt. I will come back to this in the case of the new school uh, later on. Now, uh, you may be familiar with the uh, concept of a hard budget constraint and the soft budget constraint concepts uh, introduced by the uh, Hungarian economist Janusz Kornai to describe socialism. 
well, there's a harder budget constraint for some institutions than for others uh, in this ecology. Uh, for institutions which are heavily tuition dependent and have uh, small endowments as well as perhaps small ability to raise money, uh, it, there may be a harder budget constraint. Uh, for others, the limit is defined by how much of their brand they are ready to share or to sell. For example, to the super rich seeking to enhance status. Harvard would be an example of that. What about the centrality of cost and revenue driven decisions? Well, again, we're all well familiar with many of these developments. The outsourcing of labor, for example, the multiplication of the number of adjunct faculty, I will show you some figures on that. The casualization of labor, the rise of temporary contracts is an important phenomenon, increasingly important. Uh, the reorganization of the division of labor or the labor process to eliminate roles, often facilitated by technology. The elimination of the academic secretary is an instance of that. We have just experienced that, but it's been happening for a very long time now. Academic time poverty and multitasking is the new normal. This has been discussed by a number of the writers on uh, this, the circumstances of universities today. Um, I would argue there's also been a reduction of academic discretion, both collective and individual. For instance, discretion in relation to admissions, increasingly outsourced to specialized departments, as we are familiar with at the new school, curricula, freedom in regard to curricula, publications venues, what counts and what doesn't, et cetera a growing centrality of revenue and cost objectives in decision-making um, with surplus generation in the name of survival. Again, prefiguring the discussion about the new school, it turns out that the new school has been generating a healthy surplus almost every year. And that's justified in part on the need to placate the bond markets, on the basis of the need to placate the bond markets. Uh, and yet we hear a discourse of survival and survivability continuously from university leadership. We have for decades, uh, certainly for the decade that I have been here, uh, not just in the last months. There's an assumption that students and families are also driven by financial calculations and by the value proposition. Rates of return, human capital, productivity gains, and of course, teaching effectiveness, which I didn't explicitly mention, uh, is, is pertinent there. Uh, an increasing focus on executive programs, as we have heard in the most recent uh, reform measures at the new school, this is also on the agenda, uh, has, has also been expressly discussed as an objective. Uh, or other existing or potential revenue streams deemed to be most profitable. We've had some flip-flopping about that at the new school. The idea that MA programs are profitable now that they're not profitable, for example. And of course, central to all of this, the rise of a new executive management class, mediating or making decisions. And here I'd like to show you some figures from the AAUP, which did a study on this, which was quite useful. Uh, trends in the academic labor force. The blue line at the left and the green line next to it together form the tenure track and the tenured faculty in American universities. And you can see that in 1975, together they formed 45%, if you add up those two numbers, of the faculty. And by 2015, that number had fallen to 29%. So it's not fallen to nothing, but it's certainly a very dramatic uh, decline with an increasing role for part-time faculty and for graduate student uh, employees. Let me also show you a snapshot of how this looks across different kinds of institutions. Uh, the bar on the right is the total of part-time faculty and, gra and graduate student employees as a percentage of the instructional faculty. And you can see that it varies according to the type of institution with its being the total being lowest, that's the, again, the bar on the right, the light gray bar, in uh, so-called research one institutions, the most research intensive institutions and its proportion increasing somewhat as you go toward uh, less research intensive institutions. Uh, but you'll also see that the composition of that uh, number is also changing as you shift to the right with the proportion of part-time faculty as opposed to graduate student employees very greatly increasing as you go to the right. So the less research intensive institutions, according to this conventional criterion, have uh, very uh, much more reliance on part-time faculty. Okay. Now, the neoliberal policy environment, inequality. The surpluses that I have just, uh, or that I've earlier mentioned, which are released by cost reduction and revenue enhancement, are concentrated in the hands of the executive management of the institution. And what is done with those surpluses? Well, this is the great story, which we're going to be talking about for much of what follows. Uh, we're going to later on discuss uh, 
uh, that in detail with respect to the new school, but here again, I will speak in general terms. The surpluses are employed on pet projects in conjunction with favored faculty, centers, so-called centers of excellence and other discretionary projects. There's been a proliferation of so-called centers of excellence in the whole world. Many countries have, have put a lot of money. Their ministries of higher education have put money into centers of excellence. I have myself benefited from those, by the way, uh, with fellowships from at least one of them. So I'm not in, entirely complaining about that at the individual level. But if we look at what it means, or what is the implicit premise, it's that there isn't excellence elsewhere in the system. And that one should bet on the strong, to borrow a phrase from the discussion of the Green Revolution and whether one should favor large farmers or small farmers. One argument was you should bet on the strong. Well, that's precisely what's, what's going on here with the rankings that provide a legible criterion for uh, excellence, which is to say publication in quote unquote international journals, usually American journals uh, being the, the um, uh, so-called uh, gold standard there. Uh, uh, that uh, is, um, uh, is something which these um, leaderships have uh, decided to favor. Now within individual institutions, such as um, the new school, it often takes the form of uh, very particular um, uh, resources, well, resources being de devoted to very particular uh, centers or pet projects um, that uh, form a, a kind of um, a grab bag. Resources are doled out on the basis of tournaments or favor rather than entitlements, a crucial point. A, for, uh, a former student of mine who has a position at a Japanese university, when he was first offered that position, he wasn't even told the salary. It was, it's entirely dependent, it turns out, on your uh, age and your rank within that system. There's no other element of discretion that enters, very different from here. Resources directed disproportionately to image burnishing star faculty chosen for their marketing role, which fits with the other points I've been making. A disproportionate rise of administrative numbers, salaries, and prerogatives. For example, deans, deanlets, and deanlings, to use the memorable phrase introduced by Benjamin Ginsburg in a book on this subject. Um, this disproportionate rise is justified as helping the university to survive and is an enhancing progressive outcomes as against reactionary regressive faculty. The university's top managers are selected by the trustees on the basis of criteria, again, legible to the corporate sector and increasingly forming a self-perpetuating class compensated according to advice from specialized consultants on the basis of a hall of mirrors. What do I mean? The consultants are brought in and asked, what should we pay the president? What should we pay the provost, et cetera? And the consultants say, let's go and see what other universities are paying. And then they report back and they suggest that that same amount or that same amount plus some addition be paid here. But of course, those other universities are also employing the same consultants. So you have a hall of mirrors. Trustees drawn from the corporate sector also reflect the common sense of the age. And uh, Thorsten Veblen, of course, was a harsh critic of university administration, presidents and trustees. Uh, and he was a founding figure at the New School. But that uh, lesson, that those figures do not necessarily understand what is required for education to flourish, uh, has been more or less lost uh, here as elsewhere. I recommend to everybody to read his fantastic book, The Higher Learning in America, for its acerbic wit, if nothing else. Okay. Let me shift now to the political economy of the neoliberal university in general terms before moving to the New School specifically. Who owns the university? Okay, so here I want to ask, start to ask questions about interest groups in a more fine-grained way. Uh, is it the faculty, as the faculty might sometimes think and may have thought in the past? Is it the students, as, as uh, students might sometimes think, and as neoliberal discourse also in some ways suggests? Uh, is it the trustees with whom the buck stops, we're told, here and elsewhere? Is it the senior administrators who certainly act that way very often, uh, whether or not they uh, use that language? Is it the larger community? And in that case, which one? The university as a whole, the locality, the region, the nation, or the world? To whom does it owe its responsibility? To one of the above, none of the above, all of the above? And um, with what legal and moral governance rights and roles respectively? 
these are basically unanswered and very often unasked questions about the university. To say that the trustees have ultimate responsibility and authority, as we have ourselves heard at the new school quite recently, quite a number of times, is to beg the question. It's to substitute a legal statement, which is itself not as absolute as, in fact, is made out to be, for a moral and a social question, which remains to be discussed. Relatedly, what is the university for? Is it for teaching? Is it more specifically for the transmission of knowledge, for socialization, for accreditation? And when we think about teaching, should we think about quantities being foremost, the number of students taught, or quality, what they get out of it, or how many contact hours they have, in what kinds of settings? Uh, should we think, think about it as, uh, as, as um, uh, being committed, the university is necessarily having to be committed to accessibility? Uh, to populations, to groups which have not had access to higher education in the past, for example? Should we think of it as a vehicle for meritocracy? Should we think of it as a vehicle for social justice or other ideals? And what kind of knowledge is being propagated through this teaching? Is it knowledge that is important for its own sake, for the flourishing of the human being, to use Amartya Sen's language, or is it for the sake of human capital, instrumental to economic or other goals as the University of Chicago view, which has been so influential in the economics of higher education and in higher education discourse generally would suggest. And what about research? Is it for the advancement of knowledge? Um, and for whose benefit? The researcher, the community of researchers at large, students, society, or future generations? How should we think about who research is meant to serve? Or are there other objectives still? For example, regional development. There's been an enormous attention to the role of universities in successful regional development experiences in recent years. Is it one of the above, none of the above, or all of the above? The same problem of weightage arises because of these, and, and, of, and of, uh, of, of the, the respective uh, um, prerogatives um, of these different uh, kinds of considerations um, uh, as earlier. Now, how did the traditional university deal with this problem? Well, it seems to me that the traditional university uh, did not um, consciously address this problem, but it dealt with it de facto by devolving rights and responsibilities to multiple centers of power, to different fora for deliberation. It was very often a federal structure with elements of what Europeans call subsidiarity. In other words, allowing decisions to be made at the lowest level possible, wherever possible. And this was a way of enabling plural values to um, coexist. We might think about the Oxford and Cambridge university system is a good example of that, but I think many other university systems are too, or were. So we had distinct educational values existing alongside one another in these systems, with none achieving a permanent dominance. A slow moving machinery for decisions, yes, but also checks and balances. And the coexistence of distinct types of values in another sense, aristocratic values, which have been a part of university education. For instance, deference to criteria of excellence chosen by the collegium and status hierarchies, which we might abhor, but which were certainly part of it on the one hand, and democratic values on the other hand. For instance, demands for collective deliberation and reason giving within the collegium, recognition of social responsibility to educate, and so on, also playing a role. So we had inequality and equality in different dimensions which is not to suggest that it achieved any particular goal well, but I simply want to note that there was a plurality of values uh, which was present. Now, in contrast, I would suggest that a core feature of the neoliberal university is what I might call, we might call financial dominance, by which I mean the growing dominance of financial considerations at times obscured by jargon, seemingly even to the protagonists, for example, the top leadership. Uh, I've already referred to the discretion employed by the top executives to win friends and influence people, to use the phrase of Dale Carnegie, within the institution. 
This is a war of position, distributing largesse to, to support specific non-financial values. For example, the supposed um, uh, academic imperative to study a particular subject, which is given priority, thereby reinforcing the legitimacy of the top leadership as pursuing academic values, while at the same time deflecting questions about financial dominance. We might also think of this as a divide and rule strategy. Financial dominance is facilitated by structural obscurity regarding the finances, which aids discretionary resource distribution by the university executive. Excellence, as already noted, is judged by monetizable external rankings and also media attention, another new currency of the neoliberal university. Um, with particular individuals or research groups which receive media attention also gaining internal favor because of the potential marketing advantages. Though, of course, they may not always recognize who really does have media attention uh, for their own reasons of wanting to divide and rule. Uh, centralized executive decision making, I've already noted, credible uh, with, with criteria legible and translatable to corporate interests. Uh, much effort is given to quantification and record keeping in the service of this kind of monetization, whether direct or indirect. And uh, many of the faculty at the New School are aware of a, so a, a, a software called Literati, in which we're meant to introduce um, our entire publication record, where it is we spoke during the year, and so on and so forth, so as to uh, enable quantification of our productivity. Uh, if it can't be counted, then it doesn't count, is the management maxim underlying this. Now, as some of you will know, in administrative systems, uh, such as the UK's, where um, the government has given money to individual institutions based on their quantified research output. This has an explicit dollar or pound sterling translation. Uh, the number of publications uh, in journals of a uh, so-called international standard, for instance. That is not the case in the United States, uh, but there is still uh, an indirect reference of this nature. Okay. I want to also note the importance of intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, considerations, intrinsic motivations versus extrinsic incentives, we might call them. What do I mean by that? Many of us study what we want to study because we are interested. We have curiosity, for example. We would like to be permitted to engage our curiosity. We don't have to be provided a carrot or indeed a stick in order to uh, undertake our um, exploration of intellectual problems which are of interest to us. That's because we have a motivation from within. One might call that an intrinsic motivation. In contrast, a typical example of an extrinsic motivation is if I do this, I will get paid a bonus. Or if I don't do this, then I will um, not get paid a bonus, or indeed maybe I will go to jail. Right? So there's a use of carrots and sticks which is involved in extrinsic incentives. Now, as many authors, again, have pointed out who've gone into this uh, uh, debate, academic labor, both teaching and learning, is grounded in considerable measure in intrinsic motivation. The neoliberal university is organized to exploit these intrinsic motivations wherever they're present. Indeed, uh, it's one of the ways in which it engages in what some Marxists would call super exploitation, uh, and uh, uh, tapping the fact that people are ready to exploit themselves uh, in, in, this, in certain respects uh, because of their own motivations, uh, but also turning that to institutional advantage. At the same time, it appeals to the necessity for extrinsic motivations to justify the allocation of surplus to desired ends. For example, top executive salaries. We have to pay them that much in order that they will work here, as well as discretionary projects, which are assumed to need resources in order to get off the ground and in order to succeed. By the way, Side point, one of the best conferences I ever attended was a conference uh, in honor of Gilbert Ryle at Oxford. I just happened to walk into it. I happened to be at a Oxford College one particular day uh, and the philosopher Gilbert Ryle and they had no budget. In fact, they asked everybody to donate 10 pence for a cup of tea. And that was a delightful example for me. The complete absence of a budget did not prevent them from having a conference and indeed a very good conference. Now, the role of intrinsic, oops, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to that. The role of intrinsic motivations makes traditional educational and intellectual values impossible to displace altogether, but their role can be and increasingly is muted. 
hence the ever-present appearance of lip service to these values within the neoliberal university. Now, crucially, giving greater importance to extrinsic motivations can crowd out intrinsic motivations, both because of the ethos that they create and the specific incentives that they create. Who wants to be the sucker, after all, who's doing something for no pay when everybody else is getting uh, paid off in one fashion or another? Okay. Finally, the science industry government nexus. This is less important for the new school, more important for other institutions. You could think about MIT, for instance, but indeed many other so-called R1 institutions um, uh, uh, are ones for which this is very important. Now, the integration of universities in the research and development efforts of larger intentional societal complexes, for example, the military industrial complex, which has been much, much criticized going back to the 1960s at least, is of course not new. But I would argue that the increasing centrality of the profit motive in these complexes is a characteristic feature of their neoliberal form, monetizing the fruits of research so as to provide large gains to private companies, individuals, and universities um, themselves, uh, which increasingly gain considerable revenues from the royalties and licenses, as well as grant overheads that are connected to such activity. And of course, individual faculty can also realize private incomes from spin-offs and various sidelines, and that becomes part of their implicit compensation package. This is most of all true in the sciences and in engineering. We can think about biotechnology, for example, as a clear area in which that's the case. In the new school, it's a very marginal uh, phenomenon, I would uh, think. The role of university executives is to facilitate the emergence and capturing of revenue streams in this, uh, uh, from this point of view. Faculty governance and student input is effectively neutered. It plays almost no role uh, in the management of, uh, of these complexes. Okay. Now, let me shift to the new school as an example in the remaining short time that I have. I would like to try to keep it short. So maybe I will zip through this in the next 10 minutes or so if I can. Uh, let me just note that uh, there are a couple of links online where you can find the work that I did earlier this summer and some recent uh, reflections on that. Uh, which contain much more data uh, about the issues that I'm going to describe and an entire database which you can investigate, which is a work in progress with the aid of the students who I mentioned uh, and indeed others. You're welcome, anyone is welcome to join us in this volunteer collaborative. Uh, and a new school free press article, the student newspaper uh, article from uh, uh, just before the layoffs, uh, outlining my argument that the new school does not suffer from a solvency crisis even if it suffers from a liquidity crisis. Um, I won't belabor that. I just want to draw your attention to that. Okay, let's now bring the, some of the themes which I've mentioned earlier home, so to speak, to the new school. And I'm just going to touch on some of them. I think there's a lot more to talk about here. Uh, and I'm conscious of that. Uh, others will no doubt have other uh, important insights and contributions about what I've missed. Uh, the reliance on insecure labor. 2019-20 numbers um, are as follows. Part-time faculty, 1,979. Separately, graduate assistants, 412. This was pre-coronavirus, mostly. Uh, Full-time faculty out of this were 427. So that's 17.8% of the total, which was 2,818 faculty members. This is in terms of raw numbers, not full-time equivalents. Uh, and it's down from 21.5% in 2009-10, uh, a decade earlier. Okay, so that's a, a small but nevertheless notable decrease, almost uh, four percentage points, uh, almost 20% of the uh, uh, original proportion. And it may fall further due to current voluntary separation measures. Now, as I mentioned, the new school was a pioneer, in fact, in using adjunct labor. And if you remember the slide which I showed you earlier, and you can always uh, go back to that, or we can go back to that, um, uh, you'll see that even for the kinds of institutions that used um, part-time labor the most, that proportion was somewhere in the range of 50 to 60%. And uh, the new school clearly is much above that. Okay, so it's much above the national average in this respect. Administrative bloat and growing inequalities. All of you, I'm sure, from the new school, many uh, by now, <clears throat> and uh, many of you in your own institutions, wherever you are, will be familiar with this that there are large gaps in compensation between executive and non-executive employees. The executive employees are classified in a particular way. In the last uh, IRS uh, Form 990, there were 23 
to which we have access from 2018, I believe. There were 23 uh, employees at the new school classified as executive employees. They had, as you can see, um, compensation packages of more than $400,000 with the president uh, having um, compensation well above a million dollars. Uh, and the average overall non-executive employees, and this of course, again, doesn't take into account um, uh, um, the fact that they're working different numbers of hours, in this particular uh, table is very low indeed. It's on the order of 40,000. Okay. There has been enrollment growth quite considerable in recent years, contrary to the claims of a impending and already impending crisis and an ever growing uh, difficulty at the new school. I would argue uh, that this is a fairly decisive rebuke to that narrative. And there's more to be said about that. And I intend to say more about that in the coming weeks. Um, but I will just point you to the university's own data on full-time equivalent enrollments, which shows a steady increase over the last decade. Okay. From 10,321 full-time equivalent in 2010 to 10,709 in 2019, uh, with a particularly large growth in undergraduate populations, which are often described by the top executives as being the most profitable, quote unquote. So where is all of this going? Well all of the, the funds being paid by these students. There has been a growth in executive leadership compensation over a 15 year period, which is remarkable. Uh, the New York City inflation price index over the 15 year period from 2003 to 2018, uh, I should have mentioned those years if I didn't, but those are the years, uh, was 38.35%. But in that period, the average executive leadership uh, uh, compensation uh, increased by a hundred uh, excuse me by 86.77 percent which was an excess over inflation of 48.42 percent okay and total executive leadership compensation the total compensation bill increased by 186 percent or 148 percent above the inflation level um, the total number in executive leadership also grew from 15 to 23 in this period, the total revenue growth was 146.88% and total enrollment growth was 126%. So I think these are very sizable numbers which suggest that there was real administrative uh, uh, bloat. And here I'm looking at the executive leadership, the small number of people at the top, not so-called management employees, which is a larger category, which I will come to next now, in fact. We don't have numbers uh, which go back deeply enough. Unfortunately, we're still working on that. Uh, for these uh, larger categories of employees. But for the large five years, 2014 to 19, there's been a growth of the management salary bill of 45%. At the same time, that institutional revenue has grown by only 17%. And inflation in New York City has been 7%. Those are the two numbers toward the bottom. The growth of the number of management employees was 40% from 339 to 473. Employees classified as management employees for purposes of reporting to the federal government. Although the growth of average management salaries was only 4%. So this isn't the very top group now, this is a larger group of employees classified as belonging to management. Uh, I've already noted that the growth of executive leadership compensation was greater indeed 19% in this same period. Meanwhile, growth of average full-time academic salaries was 17%, which is cumulatively only 10% above the rate of inflation. And now shockingly, Please note this, the growth of average part-time academic salaries was actually negative. There was a 15% contraction in average part-time academic salaries uh, during the same period. Okay. Debt financed market positioning. As many of you know, the so-called university center, Kerry Hall was financed through debt. And you can see this in the university's financial statement, which I have uh, exerted here. Uh, these are the debts which were contracted by the university um, in 2016 and earlier uh, to um, uh, maintain or finance various operations, but in particular, and, and capital projects, but in particular, the building of Kerry Hall. Now, uh, if one goes into the reasons offered for building Kerry Hall, one of the main reasons was that it was necessary to attract more so-called profitable undergraduates uh, by providing dormitory uh, space for them, which is precisely the reason that the new school in the COVID-19 era uh, is having um, uh, a lack 
of so-called auxiliary revenue, uh, which is what the financial statement uses to describe the payments which uh, students make for housing, among other purposes. Now, this might have been ex ante a good gamble, but as we see, it's not a gamble that turned out very well. And whether it was even ex ante a good gamble can be discussed. Whether university administration should be gambling on such a scale is itself a very interesting question. And I would point out, it's the very same board of trustees we have today that insists on the need for us to undertake austerity, which was responsible for this decision, it would seem. Okay, let me go a little bit more into financial dominance. I'm almost done. And so we'll have some time for discussion. This is something which was buried in the budget advisory committee's so-called micro site. If you look for an email, faculty I know received this, students may or may not have as well, from the budget advisory committee, you will see that in the summer, late summer, in part in response, I think, to our direct and frontal uh, insistence that there must be more budgetary transparency, they developed something called their uh, micro site, which contains various uh, uh, data and explanations, descriptions concerning the university budget. We did not learn very much more from that than we had learned already from scrutiny of public records, but we learned a few things. And this is one thing which I would urge everybody to look at. These are the budget request ranking criteria used by the university itself to determine whether or not to proceed with a specific capital project, according to the university. Now, I would urge you to look at these criteria, which are charmingly referred to as being in no particular order at the, in the second line. And you will see that every one of the criterion has, criteria has to do with financial considerations, in my view. There is not an educational criterion among them, except perhaps in an oblique sense. And this is financial dominance in operation. Uh, of course, you have to unpack layers and layers to get at this, right? This is the heart of decision-making at the university, which most people would uh, not have the patience to uh, learn about. Now, so, now, I'm sure there will be a response. There could be a response from the university that actually we don't pay attention to our own budget request ranking criteria. Well, I'm sorry, but all I can do is to take at face value what you tell me, which is that these are your budget request ranking criteria. Thank you very much. And if you would like to make them better or different, please, by all means, do that. Or if you want to tell me that the reality is different from what's stated there, that's also fine. Please clarify that. Okay. Centralized decision making unaccountable trustees who are responsible for the decisions which led to the current situation? Question mark. I've already uh, uh, made some remarks in that regard. Walled off top executives responsible to whom? For example, I won't name names, but there are people who, who, who um, are part of the so-called presidential leadership team who may have been very central to some of these decisions who have, whom we've hardly heard from. Uh, a specific example, uh, in relation to the new school, the so-called reimagining process currently underway about the restructuring of the university as a result of the COVID-19 induced emergency has involved the, a lack of substantial representation of academic staff. There have been a handful of academic uh, fa uh, staff, faculty, uh, I, I should have said, a handful of faculty involved in the um, various groups which were assembled during the summer uh, to um, undertake reimagining, so-called reimagining. And students, as far as I'm aware, were not involved at all, though I'm not certain about that. I think they were not involved at all. And of course, external consultants with so-called expertise figured heavily uh, in this process, and in particular in the recommendation of uh, who exactly to fire, which as we see was uh, far from obviously efficient. In fact, I would argue it was both inefficient and inequitable, having led to a cutting of muscle, not just not fat. And finally, what makes sense of all of this? I'm not sure that anything makes sense of all of this, uh, but it's important to note that there's an obscurantist rhetoric which provides a kind of portmanteau, an ever-present wrapping for uh, uh, all of the decisions which are made. And I can do no better than offer you the vision statement concerning the new school, which is on the new school's website as an example of that obscurantist rhetoric, which we can find, I find hard to make sense of, uh, let alone, to relate to the particular decisions that have been made recently and that are being made and that have been made for quite a long time in this institution. Let me end there. I have uh, tried to offer my own uh, 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 limited uh, uh, insights as to what is the situation locally and 
nationally and globally uh, in this respect. And I think there's much more, uh, again, to be said. Thank you.